you've returned to your home country of South Africa a number of times and worked on personal projects, and most notably the um, Truth and Lies uh, project. I imagine that must have been quite a personal uh, project for you. It was. Um, I'd gone back in 1996 um, because my sister was getting married. And my parents, I wouldn't say that they were radical, but they were certainly kind of very aware of what was going on. My mother was the deputy mayor of Cape Town when Mandela was released. And um, I remember these scenes every Sunday night. There used to be the um, Truth Commission scenes unfolding on the television. And I came back to London, I was so gripped by it that I came back to London, wrote up this proposal, which I then put to the New York Times. I, I couldn't get funding in the UK, but I put the proposal to the New York Times magazine, Kathy Ryan, who immediately said, I'll send you um, for the first trip. And that was in 97, it was the next year. and. I arrived, in fact, on the, that same trip, I was commissioned to do a cover for the New York Times magazine of Mandela. He was still the president then. And from that trip, they st I produced these images and they commissioned me to do another trip and then ran this huge spread within the New York Times magazine. And of course, I was gripped at that point. I mean, it was my idea, but then I had to fund it myself. Um, Funnily enough, the only other person who put any money into it, and she claimed it was from her own personal purse, was Anita Roddick. She was still alive mm -hmm. then. And I worked on it, um, so I worked on it really between 96 and 2001 when it was published. Um, what I didn't know was that I would, there would be two books really. There'd be the images and then I'd have to write it as mm -hmm. well. I worked very closely with an, a brilliant editor who was working at Granta, who published it, Liz Jovi. Mm -hmm. And that took a lot of work. Um, and she also sent me back, um, or suggested that I go back to get more sort of contextual, contextually based images. So I did consciously landscape images to mm -hmm. set the sort of positioning so that it wasn't really only um, portraits of the victims, the perpetrators, the Truth Commission hearings themselves, exhumations, um, or any of the other. It, it, it then just became this wonderful kind of very rounded project. And it wasn't like for the Truth Commission I could be everywhere at any one time. It was impossible. It was going on all over the country in little villages, big towns. Um, so it was a big question of A, my timing, and B, luck. And that was also because I was still working very hard here. I was going from lots of kind of commission portrait work, and that was paying for me to go back. So I'd, I'd bomb back into South Africa sort of four or five times a year, hoping to catch the most majorly important hearings. And very often I did, and there were omissions but I couldn't be everywhere all of the time. But I think that I got some of the most important. Was it tricky to get a cooperation? Because you photographed, I mean, for example, people like Eugene Terra Blanche, mm. you know, who I imagine might have been quite tricky to get access to. Well, um, I had to, it was a huge amount of kind of faith and, um, and also just going for it. I mean, for example, I knew that he was appearing in, I think it was Mafeking in the Northern Cape. So I would go, I would literally set up a, stu a makeshift studio, and that one was outside. When the, I'd try and find somebody who was kind of connected to him, and then I'd go and I'd say, can you, can you get Eugene Terblanche at the end of the hearing? And in fact, he was not very <laughs> easy, he was very difficult. Um, because the night before, this is quite an amusing story, I was talking to all these, um, there was a set of media people from the South African Broadcasting Corporation, the SABC, who were um, working on something very regular covering of the Truth Commission. It was called Special Assignment. And um, we all talked about how Ter Blanche had his, how he used to brush his hair over the top of his head because he was balding. 
And so I had this in my head that I would ask Ter Blanche to turn around. And when I, f so I did this, these very strong portraits on, in fact, there's one on, on a four by five Polaroid where it literally looks like the Polaroid has started to burn at the edge because it's mm -hmm. kind of, that, I, I don't know if you remember I that mean, effect. That one, yeah. 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 And, uh, and then later I said to him, so uh, Mr. Terblanche, do you think you could turn around? And he looked at me and he said, and he was quite terrifying. He said to me, and I have to say it in Afrikaans and then I'll translate. He said, Ekis nia mofini, which means I'm not gay. But it's very hard to translate because it sounds so mad. And I had no idea what he, I mean, it was such a mad, you know, did he think I was going to kind of roger him from, <laughs> it was such a mad sort of idea. And so some of the experiences I had were just kind of yeah. indescribably filled with poignancy and pathos to being fairly sort of peculiar and strange. And did you manage to keep yourself neutral throughout it? It must have been quite hard, which is why I asked, um, being a personal project. Yeah, very hard to keep objective and to keep, and I had to, but I, I mean, some of the, I had one um, session where there were five perpetrators together, and it was very scary because, I mean, these people, their power and their, their power was in the numbers. I mean, they were weak when they were without each other, but as a group, you know, and if you looked at the terrible things they did, for example, the, this particular group when they were called, they were um, being, having a hearing in Pretoria, they'd left, they'd gone into this policeman's house, they'd killed him, they'd killed the wife, and left the baby with the with the parents' bodies for the night, you know, there were there were very tough stories, and um, I think my luck was that unlike the con the local journalists and TV crews, I could leave and I could come back, whereas some of my um, very close colleagues um, who I worked with there were beset with all kinds of medical conditions. One friend had double pneumonia, another one had two heart attacks, somebody else had a breakdown. And I was, I was lucky because I could leave and I could go away and I could come back again.